Hello, we are live for today's webinar. I'm just going to give it a minute to have more attendees join in and then we can get started. Hello, I think we can get started now. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Be Based Wise. I am Shweta Dandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Based Wise. Many of you would have seen me on several of our webinars. Uh, today's webinar is going to discuss a recent analysis uh, on global waste management, which is jointly published by UNEP and ISWA. So we have a lead author of the report, Zoe Lenkowitz, who is uh, moderating this webinar, essentially. She is going to talk to uh, the president of ISWA, Carlos Silva Filo, and the technical director of ISWA, Aditi Ramola. Uh, thank you so much for all the last minute registration. We've had a pretty large registration number this time. And uh, if we also received your questions, some of which have been passed on to the speakers. This is going to be more a conversation, not really presentations, etc. So please feel free to send in your questions into Q&A and uh, the panelists will respond to them wherever, however they see it. Either they'll speak to you or they will write a comment in your uh, questions. So over to you, Zoe. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sweta. And hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I am in sunny Portugal right now, but um, Aditi and Carlos are having a very early morning um, from Latin America. So thank you both very much for um, for dragging yourselves out of bed at some unearthly time to, uh, to join us here today. Um, and thanks to everybody who registered and has joined us, or indeed those of you who are watching this again later. Um, so as Sweater introduced me, my name is Zoe Lenkovich. I was the lead author for the Global Waste Management Outlook 2024, which was a joint publication between the United Nations Environment Programme and the International Solid Waste Association. Um, I'm going to show you a few slides. We're not going to overdo it with the PowerPoint, I promise, um, but it's helpful just to set the scene. Some of you may have seen this presentation before. For others, it might be completely new. So I will just share a few slides um, that summarize the findings of the report. And then we're going to go into um, more in-depth discussion with Aditi and Carlos. So here we go. Uh, can you see this OK? Yeah, great. Yeah, Super. Please. Thank you. So here we go. Um, the report was called the Global Waste Management Outlook 2024, uh, Beyond an Age of Waste, Turning Rubbish into a Resource. And there's our beautiful picture from the dump site, um, which is a scene that many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with. Right. So what did the report find? Well, the, the data analysis team did a wonderful job gathering as much waste data as they could from around the world. Now, of course, not every country has accurate waste data, um, but you know we used the best and the most up-to-date figures that we could find. And what we revealed, or what the data revealed, is that there isn't a single country on Earth, oh, sorry, it's flicking through without me. <laughs> uh, there isn't a single country on Earth that has managed to successfully decouple waste generation from economic growth. Right. So as people get richer, we buy more, we use more, and we throw more away. Um, obviously, the wealthy countries are really unsustainable rates of resource use and waste generation. And um, and then there's a lot of emerging economies uh, where waste growth is happening very quickly. Um, as this graph shows, so this graph, I'm just going to um, explain it a little bit. The purple blocks represent the amount of waste that was generated in 2020. Now the darker blocks in there are the uncontrolled waste. So that's the waste that either isn't being collected at all or it is being collected and then it's either being dumped or burned. So in other words, it's leaking into the environment as pollution. Then when we look forward to 2050, according to our projections, we can see these columns towards the right that have got rapid waste growth. And these are you know, many emerging economies, they're fast growing economies in Africa and, and Southeast Asia and Central Asia. 
Um, and what we can see here, um, you know, let's look, for example, at East and Southeast Asia, that block of waste is, you know, we're going to be reaching over 100 million tonnes per year. Now, of course, there's a lot of population in these areas. So it doesn't mean that these people are more wasteful necessarily than others, just that there's so many people, that means there's a lot of waste. And then if we look at the the thick, the, the, the darker bar there at the bottom, that's how much of it we anticipate. If we carry on the way we're going, that's how much is going to be leaking into the environment environment as pollution. So you can see we've got a real lot of work on our hands to stop the worst of these, you know, uh, this, this situation from happening. Right, so what we did to look ahead to the future, we modelled three scenarios. The first one was waste management as usual, which assumes that we continue as we are today. Yeah, so the, we're collecting the same kind of percentage, we're managing it in more or less the same way, uh, but waste is growing every year. Um, then waste under control. Um, with this scenario, we assumed that we are managing to um, to prevent some waste with you know some measures of preventing waste. We're managing to collect more and we are also recycling more. So less is going to disposal. And then the final scenario, circular economy, assumes that we've really nailed waste prevention. OK, so so we managed to sorry, we've managed to decouple um, economic growth and waste production. Um, we are collecting all of the waste, so none of it is leaking into the environment from residents and small shops and so on. And we're managing to recycle 60% of what we recover or what we what we collect. And that includes, you know, composting and so on of food waste, as well as the dry recyclables like paper and metals and plastics and so on. Now, what we found when we looked at these scenarios was quite worrying. We did a life cycle assessment of each scenario, um, looking at the impacts on global warming, so the greenhouse gas emissions, on ecosystem quality, so that's including you know, pollution of waterways and land and so on, and then finally looking at the impacts on human health. And what we found, so if the zero line on this graph is 2020, um, what we found is that if we carry on the way we're going, the negative impacts are going to almost double by 2050. OK, waste under control. Um, it, there's some negligible improvements, but it's still not really good enough because obviously the impacts at 2020 are already quite significant. And finally, obviously, the circular economy scenario represents really major improvements in terms of environmental sustainability and human health. Then, importantly, we looked at the costs because not everybody is completely driven by uh, you know, environmental protection and so on. Some people need to see it in monetary terms. So the analysis team um, looked at all of these costs, with not just the costs of the waste management services, which are represented here in the, the colored blocks, but then also looking at the costs of the negative impacts on climate change, on human health and so on, and also the gains from recycling, which are represented here with the blue dot underneath. And that shows the kind of environmental improvements from um, you know, recycling materials and the avoidance of more raw material extraction, which is ultimately the goal of recycling. Right Now, what we found, 2020 baseline, um, full net cost, $360 billion. Um, waste management as usual in 2050, $640 billion every year, just on our municipal waste. It's, it's completely, um, I find that a startling figure. And that's certainly not the future that any of us wants. I can think of 640 billion better things to be spending that money on than our waste. Um, so waste under control scenario brings that cost down to just below where we are at the moment. And of course, that's assuming a lot more recycling here. And then finally, the circular economy scenario was the only one that resulted in a full net gain of over $100 billion every year. So it's kind of a no brainer. It's very clear from these three scenarios that the only future that any of us would probably be interested in pursuing is this circular economy scenario. So look, the last Global Waste Management Outlook was published in 2015 and its findings, you know, the analysis was slightly different, but the findings were ultimately the same. We need to be reducing waste. We need to be making sure that everybody has access to a waste collection service and we need to be you know, improving workers' rights and improving the amount that we recycle and so on. So why is progress so slow? You know, we're not asking for anything new. 
So we looked into this and what we found was that, first of all, the health and climate impacts are still overlooked or maybe not clear to a lot of decision makers. So that's something that we really need to focus on, making sure that anybody with, with budget responsibilities with waste management and um, wherever they are that they understand the health and climate impacts of poor waste management because if we're not factoring those impacts in um, those costs are going to be um, not included and therefore we're not taking an accurate view of the value of waste management. Right. Secondly, women are neglected. So women's role in the household, traditionally speaking, um, you know, it's women who are responsible for the shopping and the cooking and the cleaning and the domestic waste disposal. OK, but when we look at community level and we look at organising a waste service, women are often not in the room. OK, so mistakes can be made or assumptions can be made that are not correct and therefore systems are not as effective as they might be. So we really need to make sure that women are involved in decision making around local waste management systems. And the same for the informal waste workers, right? These are often in many communities. These are the waste management experts that we have. OK, but for some reason, once we try to formalize systems, they're quite often not involved. We're not including them. And so we're losing a lot of that expertise and knowledge um, and equally these informal workers who are often already quite vulnerable and marginalised, they are losing out. So we need to make sure that as we develop our systems, we are being inclusive in our system design. OK, then enforcement and penalties are weak. And this this is the same all over the world. You know, you get caught doing some crimes and you're in prison for a long time. But with waste crimes, it's, you know, the fines don't seem to be um, enough as a, of, a of a deterrent. To, to stop people from dumping, burning, exporting waste even. All this kind of thing needs a lot of um, a lot of attention. And finally, are polluters paying? They don't seem to be. You know, we've tried voluntary commitments. They don't seem to be having the impact that we had hoped for. Um, and so really now it's going to come down to governments mandating for change. So then we looked ahead at the recommended pathways. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. This is 2024. We've got more access to data and more ways that we can collect data than we've ever had before. And this is putting a lot of power in our at our fingertips. Um, you know, for example, through the use of waste apps, lots of people are getting access to a waste service that they never had before. Um, there's lots and lots of ways, and, and it's all discussed in the report about how this data and shift to digitalization can really help drive our pathway towards more circular economies. I mentioned the, the need for governments to come up with proper rules to ensure that polluters pay. Um, so, you know, evolving on from what we've learned from the voluntary schemes um, and, and just making sure that that money comes into the system to help pay for the waste management services um, that are needed as a consequence of these polluters activities whether that be, you know, putting packaging or products onto the market that are not built to last. Um, we talked about being inclusive in our approach to engaging with citizens and integrating the principles of a just transition. Go, this goes back to the informal sector and making sure that everybody is included, everybody's respected, everybody is paid for their service to society, yeah? not just the value of the materials they collect, because that keeps people very poor. OK, it's, 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 it's exploitative in some cases um, and it's not fair. So we need to make sure that with all of these discussions, we are centering the people whose livelihoods depend on the waste that they're collecting. And finally, we desperately need to build more national expertise. Um, you know, there are a number of waste management consultants working internationally, um, but what's really needed is for every country to have their own waste management experts, uh, because I really believe that, you know, when you're in your in your local area, you have a much deeper understanding of the cultural context. You understand the road network, the hotspots, all of this. Um, so any advice that you as national experts provide is more likely to be appropriate, sustainable in the long term and so on. And you're going to have more skin in the game. So it makes more sense. OK, so I'm going to leave you with this quote uh, from the report. Pollution from waste knows no borders. 
sectors. So it's in everyone's interest to commit to waste prevention and invest in waste management where it's lacking. The solutions are available and ready to be scaled up. What's needed now is strong leadership to set the direction and pace required and to ensure that no one is left behind. Okay, so that is the end of that short presentation. Um, I hope that was informative for you. And now I'm going to welcome into the discussion Aditi Ramola and Carlos Silva Filho, both from the International Solid Waste Association. Um, I'd like to hear from you. Maybe we can ask Carlos first and then come to Aditi. Um, how has the report been received? In because you you travel around the world, going to, attending very high level events with the United Nations and different groups. Could you tell us a little bit, please, about how the report has been received and what the key messages you think that have that have really hit home for those high level stakeholders? Thanks. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you very much. Congrats for the excellent presentation, the main data that you just uh, um, shared with us. Thank you, Zveta and uh, BWS Wise for organizing this uh, webinar so we can discuss about this uh, very important publication. And indeed, I'm traveling around the world uh, uh, sharing this uh, uh, data and the information and also uh, the pathways towards the future and uh, recommendation. It's uh, being quite well received. Uh, first, because it's a very, I would say, um, wide and comprehensive uh, data source in terms of like a global waste management is the most update, up to date and uh, the most uh, a comprehensive a set of data that has been uh, compiled to uh, uh, um, be part of this uh, report. Uh, uh, secondly, because uh, um, it's kind of like a different of the previous publications because the approach brought uh, uh, in the Global Waste Management Outlook 2024 is um, a looking forward approach. It's not anymore just analyzing uh, uh, historic data and um, picking the problems, the challenges, but really uh, looking into the future. And also what's uh, being very much appreciated is uh, the scenarios approach. So kind of like, okay, we have, uh, we have options. It's up to us, it's up to governments, it's up to businesses to decide how we want to move forward into the future. Like, uh, do we want to keep business as usual? Okay, but then the costs will be very, very uh, uh, high and the impacts will be as higher as the costs. Uh, so we need to move into waste under control as the previous edition of the Global Waste Management Outlook, which I also had the pleasure to contribute. So kind of for me, it was really, really nice to see the different approach and how we really uh, uh, um, kind of like uh, have to be more ambitious because we also saw in this uh, uh, report that bringing waste under control will not be enough, uh, uh, but it's mandatory. So kind of, we cannot be in the 21st century uh, still uh, using practices from uh, the medieval times. And then uh, for the first time, there was this analysis how a better waste management system considered under a circular economy framework will uh, be positive. So uh, this is uh, how uh, uh, I see the audience receiving and uh, really, really considering as a groundbreaking report. And also one thing, Zoe, like a, I think like a, this webinar is very useful too, and we should also aim for some others is kind of like a really uh, uh, diving into some specific cases as you highlighted during your presentation because kind of like a, we launched the report in February. It's uh, uh, almost uh, six, six months from now. Uh, 
and there are some particular details that we should take into consideration, such as informal sector, such as some businesses, uh, such as the zero waste, because we also have this zero waste initiative by the United Nations. So I think like uh, there are plenty of material and discussions to be there. But uh, for now, uh, it's it's very much appreciated the way uh, uh, the report was structured and uh, how to look into the future. Great. Thanks, Carlos. No, really, really good to hear. And I know that you've been um you've been really pushing the the key messages from the report um at every platform that you've had the opportunity to speak on. And that's been really, really great. So thank you for that feedback. That's super. Um Aditi, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Zoe, Carlos, and thank you, Sveta, for organizing this webinar. Um, just uh, highlighting and adding on to what Carlos has said. This report has been released, I think, at a very uh, pivotal moment in time because the world is currently discussing two different things uh, related to waste and resource management. Uh, you've, of course, been following the plastics treaty negotiations, and uh, the report is, you know, fitting right, right into the whole process. All the key messages that we are talking about, that uh, Zoe referred to, and that Carlos is referring to. Uh, we've been making sure that the negotiations um, get those inputs. And uh, now we're actually in the process of looking at the draft treaty text. And so aligning that with all the, all the key messages of inclusivity and just transition and so on. That's specifically focused on plastics. And the other big negotiations or uh, conferences that go on currently are on climate change. I mean, it's it's quite apparent that we are um, there is some change in the climate that's going on. Um, of course, the debate is still on about uh, who believes what side of it. But what ISWA is doing, we're amplifying the voice of our sector, of the waste and resource management sector, and saying that there is an inextricable and undoubtful link between good waste management and climate change. And within the report, if you've seen, I mean, Zoe presented some numbers. Um, our system boundary, I saw that questions have been asked in the Q&A. The system boundary that we drew for this report, uh, as it was also similar to the first report that we had in 2015, was municipal solid waste. So that's waste being generated by municipalities, households, small businesses, anything that the municipal system is responsible for. And what we saw from the uh, from the results is that 2.3 billion tons of municipal solid waste was being generated in 2020, and this is going to go up uh, by even you know 75, 80 percent by 2050 if we go in that first scenario route, which is the business as usual. And uh, what we are trying to say as the International Solid Waste Association is that um, if the business as usual is going to be followed, we are of course going to be in dire straits, but there are solutions, there are pathways that we can you know, go on that can help reduce and alleviate the impact of bad waste management. And so uh, we've been working with our national members as well as uh, members who are not yet our members, but are part of the global process, that they need to take a call to action. They basically need to talk to their national governments and um, waste has to be tackled in their nationally determined contributions. And currently in this COP, COP29, which will happen later in the year in Azerbaijan, um, we are going to see a big push towards methane emissions from our sector. Uh, because you've heard about the Global Methane Pledge, uh, which came out a couple of years ago, organic waste management has become a key um, a key issue to be addressed, and our sector is very well placed to do that. So we've been, you know, uh, from the panel um, that of uh, the the channels that we have and the platform that we have, we've been talking about this, so urging governments to um, move towards better waste management, better organic waste management. Um, we talk a lot about financing. There is a project that we're doing at ISWA. We talk about how to finance these systems because, because funding is usually what we lack in and we find challenging in our sector, but this is something that we are also addressing. So we are using all the key messages that came out, all the findings that we've done, uh, we've analyzed and found, um, and we're taking that forward to now governments at the national level. Um, just want to uh, highlight also that of course, waste management, the global waste management outlook is giving us a global outlook on what waste, uh, you know, what the sector is doing. But eventually, all the solutions have to be implemented at the very local level. And so even there, we have um, pathways for people to adapt 
these key global messages to their situations. And we, we, we are doing that through many good projects on the ground. So this is just a small introduction and I, I'll pass it back to Zoe. Thanks. Wow, you are definitely busy, aren't you? <laughs> um, and this is a, a nice, really great thing about ISWA is that you do have connections in so many countries. Um, you know, any any government or municipality that's looking to improve its waste management um, activities, including waste prevention, of course, um, ensuring universal access to waste collection and looking at recycling technologies. Um, I think there's, I don't know how many regional chapters there are now of ISWA. Maybe Carlos can come in there. Five regional chapters. Okay, great. And and of course, this is this message has been getting out to those as well, Carlos. Is that right? That's it, Zoe. And like uh, we we had uh, two weeks ago um, the launch of the Portuguese version of the executive summary of a global waste management outlook uh, here in Brazil. So like uh, I'm based in Brazil, as you mentioned, we are in the sunny Portugal. I'm how I'm now like uh, in the kind of like a chilly Brazil. Like we are getting like a a cold week this time for like a winter. Uh, and uh, two weeks ago, we had the visit of uh, Ms. Inger Anderson, the executive director of uh, UNEP here in Brazil. And then like uh, uh, the, the UNEP Brazil launched the executive summary in Portuguese. Uh, uh, they, they are working to translate the sum executive summary in uh, other uh, six languages. So uh, French, Arabic, Russian, Spanish, Chinese. Are, are are coming very soon so uh, to 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 really spread out the messages and uh, from uh, GWMO 2024 and make it available and easily uh, uh, comprehended and received by many countries because this is as Aditi said our role now is uh, to make it mainstream yeah. and this is something I, I think so you captured very well when uh, preparing the report that one of the challenges we have and it it, it also like a uh, uh, justify the numbers that we see uh, currently is because waste is still not mainstream we have many many other topics that like uh, uh, are uh, up high in the uh, priorities for governments for companies for uh, people and waste is still kind of like an overlooked topic. And now uh, I think that this is one of the, the roles of uh, uh, GWMO 2024 to bring waste upstream. Like uh, uh, both you and Aditi mentioned that we are attending and uh, uh, participating actively in the negotiations of uh, a legal instrument, a legally binding instrument to beat plastic pollution the so-called plastic treaty. And we are going to the final round. And going to the final round, it's uh, uh, with all the data from GWMO 2024, gives a lot of subsidies for the decision-making process, gives a lot of subsidies on how to really frame the responsibilities and uh, uh, also the solutions to be implemented in order to beat plastic pollution. Because this is another thing. We won't be able to only beat plastic pollution and we cannot afford to only beat plastic pollution. We can, we need to beat, we must beat pollution at all. Uh, because uh, uh, also as the United Nations is uh, really advocating uh, nowadays, we are living on a triple planetary crisis. Crisis of pollution, biodiversity loss, and uh, a global warming. And waste is one of the root causes for the triple planetary crisis, but it's also the solution, bad, uh, better waste management, sound waste management is also uh, the solution to really defeat the triple planetary crisis, to stop pollution, to uh, prevent biodiversity loss, and to really mitigate climate change as a mentioned. So we really need this uh, group of uh, information together with this group of people to make it mainstream, to, uh, let's say, raise the awareness for uh, these topics and to make the change. Because this is, I would say, like a, this is a very important message. The change is urgently needed. 
It absolutely is. Thank you, Carlos. That's great. Really, really interesting. And while you've been talking, actually, I've been looking at a few of the questions that have come in. And I thought, perhaps, first of all, I'm just going to explain why what what the scope of the report was and why we chose that. OK, so um, it's own, right. For those of you who are not too familiar with waste and its management, we normally divide waste into different categories. So the first is municipal, and that's the waste that comes from our homes, small shops, streets, that kind of thing. Then there's commercial and industrial waste. So this is the, the waste that comes from factories and so on, and, and like big superstores, all that kind of thing. Um, and then we also have agricultural waste, of course, which arises on all farms, includes a lot of organic waste, but also would include things like um, containers with residue of pesticide and that kind of thing that needs taken care of. Um, and then finally, there's, there's healthcare or clinical waste, which again is, is very specific. It could be um, parts of bodies, for example. Um, it could be bloody bandages or syringes. So there's all sorts of special wastes in healthcare waste. Now, for this report, we decided to only focus on the municipal waste. Why? Because it's actually one of the trickiest ones to deal with. We all generate it every day. You know, whenever you throw something away, that's municipal waste that you're generating. OK, so we get municipal waste wherever there are human settlements. So whether that's a huge city or a tiny village, and this is therefore also the waste that people are having to deal with on a very day to day basis. OK, the stuff from um, big businesses or factories um, that tends to be more homogenous. So it's going to be fewer materials and larger quantities of them. So in that regard, they can be easier to manage. Um, Likewise, from agriculture, you know, we know that it's majority organic waste and then some of these special containers with residues in and so on. So, again, it's quite a quite a particular thing and it's going to arise in a certain place and as well with healthcare. I don't need to explain that one. But so that's why we've focused in this report just on municipal. Um, it's it could be perceived as a weakness of the report, of course, because there's a lot of waste to deal with um, from all of these different sources. And and we, you know, we absolutely support the addressing of those waste streams as well. Um, a lot of the time there's a lot of cross crossover anyway. Right. So if you live somewhere that doesn't have a very organized waste management services, then it's likely that at the dump site it's waste from all of these places. OK. Um, in which case it's being managed like municipal waste. So, uh, you know, uh, we decided to just focus on municipal anyway, and that's what we've done for this report. Um, we think it's the most pressing and urgent and also relatable for people because everyone's got some contact with municipal waste. Okay. Um, and, Adizi, and Zoe, thank you. If yes. I may, oh. and, and mm -hmm. Zoe, if I, if, if I may just to jump in here, it's mm -hmm. also a matter of la lack of data. It's kind of like a what we were discussing before, like a waste is yeah. not mainstream, and we we still do not have a, a continued and reliable data available for many of these uh, waste streams in many of the countries. As it's a global report, we had to uh, research data for at least 100 something countries, I think 130 countries in order to make it like a, a, a glo at a global level. So when we, uh, the, the research team, when the technical team uh, uh, went to getting those data in many countries, many, many countries, the only available data is related to municipal waste. And even though not really uh, uh, up to date, not really easy to access. So one uh, of the recommendations of the report is really to have better data, continued data in order to monitor better this uh, 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 sector. Definitely. Thanks, Carlos. Um, Aditi, you had something you'd like to add as well. Yes, I just wanted to make a little asterisk on construction and demolition waste. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, I know it's I tricky. <laughs> yeah, it's tricky because um, a lot of times municipalities have to deal with it, though mm. the mandate is only to deal with municipal solid waste. Um, people dump their construction debris and demolition debris right on the roads. And so then a lot of times the municipalities have to collect them. Uh, and then that, you know, is a completely different ball game to deal with it because sometimes 
uh, if owing to, you know, 50 years ago, we were using asbestos and some countries like India still haven't banned it, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you you have hazardous waste there in that stream as well. So ISWA has worked with UNEP on a publication for disaster waste management, uh, disasters from, of course, man-made or natural disasters and all the things that we have to deal with. Uh, so it's a separate publication, should be out in a few, in a couple of months, uh, especially owing to the fact that um, human-made disasters are also you know, growing in numbers and we have to deal with that stream as well. So we didn't deal with it in the global waste management outlook, but um, we have another report for that. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, while you were speaking, I was actually just opening up the report because, um, for a reminder, um, because somebody has asked in the Q&A, um, what role can individuals play in supporting the goals outlined in the report? Um, which I think is a great question. Thank you, Chepo. Um, and this is something that, so in the recommendations chapter at the end of the report, there's a list there um, suggestions for individuals, for municipalities, national governments, businesses, and so on. Um, and just to say as well, we are currently in the process of producing a policymakers version of this report and also a youth version. And the youth version in particular contains a lot of you know, personal actions that we can take, how we can influence the communities that we're part of, how we can also influence the decision makers around waste management in our, in our communities and societies. Um, so hopefully they will be published in the next month or so. And, and maybe we can do another Be Waste Wise webinar about those and try to reach different audiences. Yeah, yeah. Okay, super, thanks. Now that's a good segue actually into the next part of the, um, of the discussion where I'd like to bring us down to talk about more direct, you know, um, I don't really like the saying on the ground because we're never doing it in the air, right? But actually in, in communities, what's happening? What's the most exciting, um, you know, examples of change, of positive change that you've seen. I'm going to go to Aditi first, because I know that you've been really involved in some great projects in India, haven't you? Thanks, Zoe. Yes, um, in India and Indonesia, uh, we've been working and uh, you've been part of it as well, the Clean Oceans Through Clean Communities uh, project. It started off with a focus on marine debris and marine pollution and plastic pollution in the marine environment. And very quickly, it was apparent to us that any of the things that were reaching the oceans were actually coming from land-based sources. And so that was essentially municipal solid waste or waste that's being produced um, in the coastal communities or communities upstream on rivers and so on. And so what we did is because it was, a you know, we had four or five years to think and plan. And of course, the pandemic slowed everything down and gave us time to pause. And so we... Um, looked at the integrated sustainable waste management approach, which looks at technological solutions as well as governance and financial and social, um, looking at that um, from the first global waste management outlook, if you remember the two triangles that had come out, um, looking at all those aspects and then making sure that the communities that we are working with feel a sense of ownership towards the systems that we are designing for them. So marrying the two concepts, the integrated sustainable waste management concept and an inclusive approach, we started planning and designing waste management plans or uh, waste master plans for their region. The, the nice thing about this particular project that you're involved in as well is that we're not only looking at one city or one village or a one town, we're actually looking at a bunch of villages, towns and cities together. Because what we see is the economies of scale don't work if you just draw an arbitrary system boundary. And the boundaries that come from administrative purposes don't serve the cultural, the, you know, the economic, um, what do you call it, the back and forth, people moving from one city to the other for job reasons and so on, and going back at, the, in, at night because it's cheaper to live somewhere else. So looking at a bigger um, regional uh, location or you know, looking at a bigger system boundary, made it for us more easy to make a waste master plan that could be sustainable in the long run. Because what we do want to do is that when we leave, because of course the funding is not going to be there forever, like as Carlos mentioned, these things have to come from within. People have to change the systems at their level. And so when we leave, we want something to be sustainable so that um, it doesn't collapse in a couple of years. You know, We set up a big MRF and then 
lo and behold, we've seen some of them which have cobwebs, which don't work anymore. So uh, what we've seen is that working with the communities, all the stakeholders, whether it's the business owners, it's the small entrepreneurs or the uh, waste managers themselves and the so-called informal sector, which um, as you know, all of all the all three of us don't call them informal sector. It's like the very micro private enterprises. Uh, if they're all involved and they feel an ownership towards the system, then it's, it has a better chance of surviving for a long term. And so that's what we've seen. And uh, we also work with um, behavioral change uh, campaigns, which sound very easy to do, but the most difficult actually. Um, it's it's about awareness raising. It's about communicating um, to school children all the way up to college level uh, children about waste management issues, resource management issues, the waste hierarchy and all of those things. So there is a big component of training as well. Um, this is what we're doing for the last uh, three, four years now uh, in Indonesia in three locations and India one location. And um, I think the results will be out in a, in a year or so. So that's just a small introduction to that. Thanks. Thanks, Aditi. Yeah, there's a lot of work going on there. And what I like about it, because it's covering a lot of small, smaller communities, um, there's kind of a, a feeling of being able to be a bit experimental. Um, I was speaking to one of the village facilitators yesterday who's working in a coastal community in Indonesia. And they had been trying to, um, you know, to, to change people's behaviour so that they would not dispose of their plastic waste in the sea or in the river that's going to take it to the sea. And they'd been saying, you know, we don't want plastic in the sea. Plastic in the sea is bad. And it hadn't been really enough to change people's behavior. Now, all they've done is they've added one extra message into that, which is that plastic in the sea ends up in your food chain, right? And that's actually having a difference because it's making it personal for people. You know, I think there's there's always scope for experimenting with the messaging with people and, and listening carefully to what are their priorities, because one message won't work the same in one community and, and every other community. You know, we really need to listen to people. Um, and I just want to um, acknowledge one of the comments here from Abdallah Mikulu, um, who is running a small waste management system in Tanzania, including black soldier fly larvae, um, because that's something that I'd like to move us on to now, actually, is these these kind of emerging. I know black soldier fly larvae has been around for quite a while, but it's suddenly, it seems in the last six months, it's suddenly becoming very, very popular. I mean, and we've, you know, I'm sure that I'm sure each of us has got experience of working at, at um, black soldier fly larvae at different scales. So for anybody who's not aware of this, um, who's listening in, um, it's basically it's, it's a fly called the black soldier fly. Um, it's got no mouth parts. So and it's only an adult for like nine days. So you breed them in a cage, you collect the eggs and then you hatch the eggs onto food waste that you've collected. Right. And the eggs hatch into these tiny, weeny, wiggly little maggots who are very hungry and they put they eat the food waste and they put on 25 percent of their body weight every day. Um, the, the life cycle is over within, I think, three weeks. They very conveniently, when they're full and they've done enough growing, they conveniently wriggle themselves off of the food waste and into your container. From there, you can feed them live to chickens or fish. They absolutely love them or you can dry them even in a microwave um which and it goes kind of like a crunchy breakfast cereal consistency um but that gives you i haven't tried eating one um, but but i did touch some live ones i was feeling brave um and that gives you year round animal feed and it's it's very protein rich so they're taking you know any um any wet food waste so not the not woody stuff you know they wouldn't eat banana leaves but they will eat you know cabbage leaves for example um and they're turning that that sloppy waste into protein um and in that way we can keep the you know use the food waste to serve the food chain and not lose all of that goodness um, by, you know, by thinking that composting is the only thing that we can do, obviously with composting, sorry, we're not losing the goodness, we're putting it back into the soil, but this is just like a, a smaller circle, yeah, so when we talk about circular economies, this is a really nice little example of it, it's low cost, it's low tech, um, and it's been proven, um, I think, in every continent now. So this is something that people are learning about fast. I know Aditi, you you've had some experience with this as well, haven't you? That you wanted to um 
to contribute? Um, yes, so we are uh, going to carry out some projects in Baniwangi uh, on black soldier fly larvae. Um, you're right about the fact that it, it's exploded in terms of its popularity, especially as Carlos mentioned, also the methane um, angle that's happening. Um, and so people are like looking at organic waste and there are three valorization techniques that people know, biogas, black soldier fly composting. Um, in Baniwangi, we're going to try and do some sort of an integrated approach because, um, as you said, black soldier fly larvae um, are not very fussy, but fussy enough. And so not the whole waste stream can be, uh, not the whole organic waste stream can be given to them. So we will be doing that kind of a project to just uh, showcase a pilot. Of course, one has to remember that there are obviously challenges and also, you know, disadvantages of doing that technology. If you don't have a market, it doesn't make sense at all. It becomes expensive uh, and so on. So that that for sure. And regarding food waste, because we have been approached by UNEP to do a study on food waste. And I'm going to give the floor to Carlos because we are doing something extremely innovative in Brazil at the country level. And G20 is happening and um, being hosted by Brazil this year. And so, uh, Carlos, if you can just talk about the two policy papers that we've written and how we're going into this whole G20 process, Zoe, which is very interesting for, I think, the, the, the participants to hear about. Super. Thanks, Aditi. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. Indeed, uh, these uh, food waste projects we are running here in Brazil, uh, commissioned by uh, UNEP, is really to, and it all it also emerged from a GWMO 2024 and some other reports as the Food Waste Index report, because it's how to uh, um, access better data and uh, analysis in terms of what is generated by the households. So this uh, uh, new project is uh, being carried in four cities in Brazil to really collect the waste from the households and analyze what it comes from the source, not after the, uh, the, the uh, disposal, not after the collection, but really uh, uh, at the source. And one angle is to analyze in terms of a food waste, and the other angle is uh, to analyze how uh, uh, we could develop better uh, uh, prevention measures, uh, how to really go upstream. This is uh, something that it's it's also a hot topic currently, uh, uh, and it's something that we from ISVA took very seriously. It's not uh, uh, being a downstream industry anymore, not to being the end, uh, not to be the end of pipe industry anymore, but really going upstream. And all the intelligence, all the knowledge that uh, uh, the waste industry, the waste operators, the informal sector, the uh, small enterprises, entrepreneurs have is a key in order to move upstream, in order to really uh, uh, go uh, uh, towards a prevention uh, 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 movement of, of waste. And this uh, uh, connects to one of the main recommendations of the Global Waste Management Outlook 2024, uh, that if we want to uh, uh, have a more, let's say, affordable system, a more profitable system, we need to reduce the amount of waste generated. We need to add value to waste. We need to change the current paradigm. And as, as Zoe introduced uh, at the beginning of her uh, presentation, to uh, uh, go beyond an era of, of waste. And the tagline of this report is turning rubbish into a report. And this is what we are talking about into a resource sorry <laughs> i was yeah, talking we also about turned it into a report turning yeah. rubbish, yeah, right. turning rubbish <laughs> into a resource <laughs> uh, my Excellent. my mistake so this is what we are talking about when we when we talk about uh black soldier fly uh uh technology because it's being considered a technology and uh, it's uh, uh, uh expanded a lot it's uh, uh all about turning uh, rubbish into resource. When you are talking about improving recycling of uh, 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 the dry fraction, we are talking about turning uh, rubbish into resource. So it's kind of like a demoto 
we are adopting now is that we need to uh, uh, move from considering waste as garbage in order to consider it uh, as really as uh, a resource in in many terms and uh, uh, under that perspective uh, together with the world biogas association is was submitted two policy briefs to the g20 this year both of them were were approved one is related to food waste prevention and uh, the circular economy for uh, uh, food and uh, in order to beat food loss and food waste and the other one is related to financing initiatives to mitigate uh, methane emissions from the organic fraction in order to really attract the necessary uh, funds so it's it's kind of like a an evolving topic and we are deep into it in order to really uh, move from a downstream industry to add value to the whole uh, let's say cycle to the whole value chain and in order to uh, uh, really uh, go to that figure that Zoe presented from a full net cost of more than $600 billion per year to a full net gain of more than $100 billion per year when uh, uh, we will have a more, for sure, a more sustainable system. Super, thank you very much. I've been busy responding to a couple of the uh, the question and answer. Well, I've been providing answers to a couple of the questions and we'll try and get through them all before the end of the session, but we've only got nine minutes left. So I would say that if you've added a question that we don't have time to respond to right now, please feel free to reach out to any of us on LinkedIn. I think Aditi and Carlos, you're happy with that? Um, and we will do our best to, to answer those questions for you. Um, one of the questions that's there is that is asking if the raw data from the report is going to be shared. And I'm happy to say that that's a project that's underway at the moment. So we're going to be um, we're working hard to get the data onto a website so that people can interrogate that data for themselves and draw their own findings from it, which I think is really important, particularly at a national level. Um, to be able to make those arguments to decision makers about the value of waste management. Um, and we are also going to include in that um, some a lot of case studies. So before this report came out, about six months previous, um, UNEP published another report, which I wrote, um, called Towards Zero Waste, a catalyst for delivering the sustainable development goals. And that goes through each of the sustainable development goals one by one um, and, um, and provides case studies from across the global south um, of how different communities, governments, municipalities, businesses, all sorts, how people are actually using waste prevention or waste management to meet, you know, to, to provide these other co-benefits because there's lots and lots of co-benefits to waste management. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. But what I was saying was actually when I wrote that report, the first draft, had a lot of case studies in it, but we you okay, Aditi? How you seen <laughs> stubbed your toe or something? Um, but we 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 felt in the end that that was going to make it too long. You know, no one's going to read a two hundred page report. So we've saved those case studies, and we're now going to publish them with this raw data on the UNEP website um, to to really bring help bring that data to life and show people, you know, that the human side of what those numbers actually mean. So. That should be um, available soon. I'm going to post the link um, in the chat. Oh, I've just sent it to everybody. There we go. Um, that's the link for that report. Um, that's the raw data. Somebody else has asked if we will or how often the Global Waste Management Outlook is published. So this was the second one. It was a very different style to the first one. Um, the first one's like so comprehensive. It's like a it's like a golden text, isn't it, for everything that you would need to know and understand about waste management. And um, because as I mentioned in my presentation, actually we've made such little progress since that first one in 2015, there wasn't much value in kind of trying to produce the same report but just an updated version which is why we went for this novel data analysis and really digging deep into what are the barriers to change and what can we do. So we're not sure that there will be another one quite like this, but what I would say is that 
a lot of the value from the last one came from the, the regional outlooks that ISWA um, produced that they were I think really valuable and really well um, received by people in different parts of the world because of course in a global outlook it's very um, you know that you have to speak very generally uh, because it has to apply to someone in you know in Canada as much as to someone in Benin for example I don't know so so for that reason it had to be quite um, vague on some topics but um hopefully we'll be producing regional ones and I encourage you to I think the last regional ones were published around 2018 2019 mm -hmm. so they're not very out of date you know and you can find them all online and they're a really good read actually they're really helpful and um, my favorite is the mountainous regions one the pictures are beautiful um, so that's that. And I wanted, we've got five minutes left. I'm also going to give a quick shout out about the ISWA Congress that is taking place in September in Cape Town. Um, so this is the first time that we'll have had an ISWA Congress on African soil. So there is a lot of excitement. Um, lots of people are going to have the opportunity to talk about their work that, you know, on a platform that they haven't had before and it's also an opportunity for the rest of us to really learn about you know the best and the brightest ideas in waste management in South Africa and um, you know all the neighboring countries well all of Africa and beyond there will be people coming from all over the world so if you do have a chance to come please do make the effort because it, um, it's an opportunity not to be missed and it's a great networking opportunity as well to meet people who are experiencing similar struggles to you or to meet people who have overcome those barriers that you're encountering and you can learn from them so do encourage you all to come along that's i think the website is iswa 2024.org i shared just now yeah thanks aditi perfect okay good i was right yeah so um, we have four minutes. Um, Aditi, I'm going to let you go first. Last final points, please. And then Carlos, you will also have two minutes. Thank you, Zoe. Well, last, just two minutes. We could, I think, right. talk, talk for an hour. Um, <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to go back because my mind is there. I was looking at one question which said about uh, formalizing the informal sector and then also the resistance that is being faced by them. And a um, lot of the discussion that is one, of course, when we talk about the instrument on the plastics negotiations that's happening and so on, I think we'll have to start framing that question differently. Formalizing the informal sector, it's almost you kind of other the informal sector without acknowledging all the things that they've done for the system or in the lack of a system. And um, at ISFA, we, we don't call it formalize. We actually call it include or um, not even integrate, include mostly, because you you discuss with the, the informal sector, which is the private sector, and see what inputs they can be giving to your, to your formal system. Essentially, we are trying to avoid parallel systems that don't talk to each other, but we do encourage, okay, if it's parallel and people have already, you know, have set processes in place, maybe you want to um, make them uh, make that process uh, safer for the workers there. Maybe you want to upgrade them. You know, have better PP PPP uh, PPE and so on um, to talk about people's rights and so on. But maybe you don't want to just formalize it. Maybe that discussion should be framed differently. And so there are reports out there discussing this issue, and um, I think Zoe has shared some. But that's, those are my final thoughts because uh, that's what I was thinking about. But uh, I think there are a lot of good nuggets from the Waste Management Outlook, which everyone can benefit from reading. Both, I would say, the Outlook 2024 as well as the Outlook 2015. Um, both are uh, valuable reads for anybody starting out or anybody who's in this uh, in this space. Back to you, Zoe, thanks. Well, thank you. And Carlos, two minutes for you. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. And I thank you all for attending this uh, very interesting webinar with these live conversations. Unfortunately, we could not uh, uh, answer all the questions and comments. So hopefully we'll have many 
other opportunities in the future and like uh, looking forward to see you in Cape Town this year in September. We will have a special session dedicated to the Global Waste Management Outlook 2024, where myself, Aditi and Zoe will be there to discuss in person with you. I saw one a question regarding, uh, is it hybrid? No, it unfortunately not. It's an in-person Congress. So uh, uh, please, if, if you can uh, make it to Cape Town and we will all see uh, each other there. And I would say, just as a conclusion, uh, uh, and and for me, this is uh, the core messages from a uh, global waste management outlook uh, twenty twenty four. It's it's time to really address waste uh, management at all uh, on uh, with an innovative approach, uh, with a more uh, a a different view and a more let's say future thinking approach. It's not. Uh, 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 we cannot justify anymore like, uh, okay, we've been doing this for the last 50 years, for the last century, and this is the way uh, we'll keep doing it. No, we, we need really now to be um, ambitious on the way we, we have uh, 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 to deal with waste management. And one thing like uh, I'm, I'm really promoting after Global Waste Management Outlook 2024 is like uh, we need to move from the old three R's approach, reduce, reuse and recycle that everybody knows to a 21st century 3D approach. We need to decouple, to decarbonize and to detoxify. So if we don't do that and it's uh, within our own role as individuals, we won't be able to manage the waste properly uh, as uh, uh, the, 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 the amount of waste will continue increasing, the complexity will uh, increase, the emissions will increase, and then we won't be able to afford. This is a very, I would say, simple message. If we cannot afford, we will uh, have a, a huge problem. So let's move forward. Let's have a more uh, uh, innovative approach and we will uh, be able to make the necessary change. So thank you again for the opportunity. I'm, I'm really happy to join uh, this conversation with you, Zoe, uh, uh, Aditi, and thanks, Veta, for putting this webinar together. Great. Thank you, Carlos. And thank you, Aditi. Um, so guys, you heard it here. We need urgent change and we need you to be part of it. So please do keep in touch with us all. We'll hopefully see you at the ISWA Congress. If not, maybe at another Be Waste Wise webinar coming soon. Thanks very much. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Aditi. And thank you, Carlos. That was, uh, in those packed discussions the last one hour. And uh, thanks to all, all the audience. You've been I mean, so many of you have been around till the very end. Uh, as usual, I, you can find all of them on LinkedIn. You can find Waste Rice on LinkedIn. So if you want us to connect you to any of the panelists, please drop us a message on LinkedIn or on our email. And uh, Zoe will come back with more webinars uh, in the next couple of months. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Looking bye -bye. forward to it. All right. Thank Thanks you. very bye -bye. much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks for being here. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chan.